They've been called everything from messiahs of the milk bars to the new intellectuals. Who are these angry young men? What have they in common, if anything? A number of them have set down their credos or their attitudes to life in a book called Declaration, a sort of mental bearing of the chest, a kind of mind Kampf of the young. I spoke to five of these contributors. Colin Wilson, author of The Outsider, Kenneth Tynan, theatre critic, Stuart Holroyd, essayist and playwright, Bill Hopkins, novelist, and John Wayne, critic and novelist. What I was trying to discover was whether they possessed any intellectual or ideological common denominator. Are they a cult or only a myth? I asked the five of them the very same questions. I wanted to see if I would get the very same answers. Which writer in Declaration do you disagree with most? I disagree with everybody in Declaration, with the exceptions of Bill Hopkins and Stuart Holroyd. Uh, uh, with some of them, the ones who um, show a personal malice towards me, um, I obviously disagree with particularly. Um, Tynan attacks me and Lindsay Anderson attacks me, although I don't think either of them have ever read a word I've written or understand what I'm getting at. And. Uh, both of them talk some sense mixed with a lot of utter balderdash. Well, I'd like to say Mr. Colin Wilson, but I don't think there's anything there to, uh, to disagree with. It's like you're disagreeing with a, a ton of lead cotton wool. Well, I can't say I agree with any of them, really, because they all seem to me either to be advocating a, a, an up-and-atom, old-fashioned kind of left-wing down with the governing class, so, which to me is just an example of this obsolete thinking, and the others are saying we must have something to believe in, let's look around for religion. Well, to my mind, it's got to be the other way around. Holroyd, why do you resent being labelled an angry young man? Well, that suggests that I'm only an angry young man. I don't regard myself as that. I regard myself as an artist because it's made me and the rest of us an enormous number of enemies. Well, I think partly because it um, arises the most awful expectation. If I come into a room, people sort of flinch and say, is he going to hit me or spit in my face? Uh, no, it's, a, it's, a, it's just an ordinary journalistic popularizing label without any meaning at all. Because I feel that it's a label applied externally, that it doesn't arise from any real interest in one's work, I was writing and publishing for ten years before anybody called me that, and they had plenty of chance to think of it before. Well, I resent two easy labels. There's a basic assumption in that term that we remain in a permanent emotional level, and uh, this, I think, is too easy a dismissal. Do you think writers ought to be content to be observers of life, or should they be involved in it? Well, I don't see how you can be uninvolved. No, I think it's a question of defining a, exactly what you mean by um, a uh, something like a uh, civilized human being. Because the actual word civilized means to be in a community and of it and a part of it. And if you decide that uh, I don't want any part of this, you are technically being uncivilized. I'm inclined to feel they should be involved, but not involved politically. If you get too involved, um, you lose the essential sensitivity, I think, that makes you a good writer. Both involved and be observers, but there is a third alternative, which I think is important, namely that they should have the will to change life. Have you the will to change life? To change my own life, primarily. Aren't you concerned with changing other people's lives? I think that might come as a result of my having effected a change in my own. This must come first, I think. Are you despondent about the future of Britain? I feel that um, I don't object to Britain for the same sort of reasons that uh, many of the contributors to Declaration object. I don't feel that um, royalties completely finished and outworn. At least I'd like to know what they intend to replace it with, what symbols they put in its place. Um, I do feel that Western civilization is in complete decline. 
Well, I think we could go one way or the other, and the odds are about even. What do you think the country needs most? It's difficult to put it very shortly, but new thinking, really. Uh, a refusal to abandon obsolete categories of thinking. Um, the main trouble, I mean, the one thing that could lead to our becoming really insignificant in this English-speaking confederation would be uh, if our interests became parochial and provincial in relation to this larger unit. And I think there is a big danger of that. I think that a lot of things that English people worry about are things that just don't have any relevance at all beyond our shores. And when you think, for instance, of all the fuss that goes into this you and non-you business. Immigration on a huge scale and then immigration on a, on a huge scale. I mean, let's get the English out of England and let's get somebody else in. Because I think the, the English have ploughed this country absolutely into a cultural, what I could call a cultural um, dust bowl. Everything has been written about to death. The provinces have been done to death. An exquisitely sensitive study of a town in Nottinghamshire. All that. Uh, English culture has done all it can do, I think, uh, in England. So for heaven's sake, let's get ourselves out and the, uh, the West Indians in and some Italians and some Hungarians. And, 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 uh, and in, the, in, the, in that way, let's build up the rapidly growing Australian culture, the not so rapidly growing uh, Canadian culture, and get some new eyes looking at our own country. New leaders, a new religion, a new political party, a new, completely new form of society. I think that a new political party, a new, not a new religion so much as a new religious feeling, can be promoted by new people, new leaders. Do you think there's anything fresh or new in what you've just said? Yes, I do. I think if a historian dipped into the past and could unearth a, a Greek or an Etruscan or a Carthaginian who said the same thing, then perhaps it wasn't so true then as it is today. Therefore, it's new because it's the truth of today. Absolutely nothing, but I think it's important that Every so often, that kind of thing should be said as loudly as possible by a large number of people. And maybe every 10 years, there will be, you know, people of my age who are saying exactly that over and over again until it gets through. And for the next half an hour we'll be exploring hidden worlds no not the planets of distant galaxies but the worlds which exist inside each one of us now we usually remain totally unaware of their existence until those odd moments of contact which really make us think like deja vu the process of being here before and maybe a dream which foretells the future or some other experience which could be classed as paranormal now I can only claim to be an interested observer of this subject but my first guest has made the most detailed researches into the quest for or explanations of these mysteries and in the process his own experience has led him to discover a higher being within himself which can amongst other things help to control a troubled mind he lives and works in Cornwall and here's Colin Wilson My other guest is probably better known as an entertainer, but paranormal experiences have been an integral part of his life since childhood, and his unending investigations into the force or forces which move our lives have helped him to cope with great tragedy and have also contributed to the success of his public career as a very funny man. Please welcome Michael Bentine.
gents, it's such a, a big subject and really so little time to talk about it, but um, I would like to get some ground rules, first of all. When we tend to think, if we do think at all about the paranormal, we think of frightening things like uh, ghosts, yeah. poltergeists, uh, Ouija boards, and all of that kind of thing. Um, maybe if I can turn to Colin, first of all. What is your experience of the paranormal? Is it what I've just said? Um, in a sense, but don't forget, I'm totally ESP thick. I've never had the slightest sort of psychic ability as Michael has. Uh, on the other hand, when I am totally relaxed or tremendously excited, I discover that my mind will do um, certain peculiar things. I'll give you an example. Years ago, uh, I'd given a particularly good lecture in Los Angeles and I had to meet my family in Disneyland. And it wasn't until I got to Disneyland that I realized that the place is enormous, acre after acre, and I thought, oh my God, I'm just never going to find them. But I was in a good mood because I'd given a good lecture and I was feeling pleased with myself and I thought, relax. And I deliberately relaxed totally and then I let my feet take me to them, which they did in precisely 30 seconds. We went down the road, turned left by some store where they were eating Mexican chihuahuas or whatever those things are chihuahuas. called. Chihuahuas? And they're dogs, I think. Yeah. And there was my, or, yeah. <laughs> and there was my family. And it was because I totally relaxed and what's more, I was confident and it worked. Yeah. Yes. Now normally, yes. unfortunately, I'm, my mind works too hard to do that and I, I can't relax enough. Yours are rather more extreme, your experiences, Michael. What do you mean, the Peruvians eat bigger dogs? <laughs> no, the, the, no, the Mexicans normal. probably do eat yours, actually. <laughs> no, um, uh, I, I'm very like Colin, actually. Uh, if I let rationale interfere with the intuition, uh, then I go wrong. Um, but if I get an intuitive idea, like the flea circus came from nowhere, or the bumblies, or the potties, or all those mad things I used to do in Square World, or the ideas I contributed to the goon show. They came out of left field for no reason at all. Woof, bang, and they were there. And if I then sat down and tried to logicalize them, I logicalized them out of being funny. Because the, the, the creative world is the, inst it's the world of instantaneous thought. You don't come to the conclusion by a logical process. You then say, how the hell am I going to get an 80-foot whale up the River Thames or a Chinese junk to bombard the Houses of Parliament or whatever it is? Then you come to the, the difficult part of translating the idea, which is Id completely idealized, it all happens perfectly, into practical props and make them work. That's the logical part. But that could be uh, just a vivid imagination. We'll come to that later. But, yes, you, but wait a minute. But, no, you, no. but you have been through the classic thing of the moving tables of oh, the yeah. seance, yeah. clairvoyance, yeah. And, so, and so on, haven't you? Yes, I mean, of course. But when you say vivid imagination, people say, ah, but that's your imagination. And you say, yes, well, where do you buy this imagination? I mean, because everybody's so familiar with it. Do you go down to the grocers and buy two pounds of it? Or do you get a litre and a half, because we've now gone to the common market? The answer is that all it is is the ability of the human mind to see images.